thinking about, well, how do we actually allow micro segments and data to get even more richness and insights about the personas and make them actionable? Is that, are those two points fair summaries? Yes, they're, they're great points. And I love the differentiation you make between being customer centric and customer driven. It's, it's, they sound the same and we all talk about it, but we not, not we don't all do it. Mm-hmm. So it's a very important differentiation. There. Hi, I'm Matt, your host for the CX and culture connection, the podcast for CX leaders who are looking to accelerate their growth flywheel and get more value from their investments in customer experience and culture together. Today, I'm joined by Roni, who is the uh, marketing leader at Optimove, which is an innovative company that I've enjoyed working with that's really changing the game for journey orchestration and driving customer lifetime value. Um, Roni, thanks for joining. Uh, Do you want to share a little bit more about yourself too? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Matt. Uh, it's a uh, it's an honor to be to be on the podcast. So I'm Ronnie, as Matt said, I'm the VP of Marketing here at Optimove. Uh, I've been in this company for almost five years now, um, working in different roles within marketing. As Matt said, we serve in the customer journey orchestration world, especially for marketers working with brands such as Staples, Papa John's, Intain, BetMGM. Uh, and the sort. So large uh, retailers and gaming platforms, some banks and some others that really, uh, at the end of the day, want to connect with their customers through their marketing in a personalized way. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, you know, Optimove has gotten kind of magic quadrant scores and, and great billing around helping companies make the shift from product-led to customer-led marketing. What does it mean to be customer-led? You know, this is a phrase you guys use a lot. What does it mean to be customer led and how does Optimove make this easier for its customers? Yeah, I think that it's, you know, it, it's what's needed today being customer led. It, it basically means something very simple. Instead of starting your campaign from a product or from a promotion you want to run, start it from a customer insight. Now, how do you, how do you do that? How do we enable that? So most platforms that approach marketing orchestration approach it from a journey builder, approach it from the idea that a marketer can build a journey for its customers. Now, what that means, or what I call it, is you're basically building a journey for the average. You're catering to the average. You're not catering to each individual customer. You're saying, this is what the average customer will like, and that's what I'm going to do. Starting with the customer and doing customer-led marketing is a different approach. It says start from segmentation, start from analysis from analysis of your customers, and then go into a campaign or into a message that you want to talk to them. Now, don't use a journey builder to go to the average, but let AI be the one deciding what is the best message for each customer at every time. And thus, basically what's happening because AI is using your customer data, is that your customer is leading their own journey. There's two points here I just want to kind of emphasize and make sure I'm tracking and also um, the audience, you know, uh, picks up on these two really important themes that it's okay. One is you're actually making a really good argument about the difference between saying you're customer centric and actually being customer driven which is you're responsive, you're adaptive, you're letting the data and the AI take you to an approach versus, you know, doing it more, uh, it's more emergent and data-driven versus very top drown. okay? Now, I think that's actually, there's a lot more to this, but like this idea of being customer-driven and really adaptive, Stephen Heckel talks about the adaptive enterprise and a responsive enterprise, you're enabling that at scale with micro-segmentation, and we'll talk more about that. The, the second point is that, you know, right on average, wrong all the time with, with you know, averages, um, is that you're actually taking historically more creative driven approaches to personas and, 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 and thinking about, well, how do we actually allow micro segments and data to get even more richness and insights about the personas and make them actionable? Is that, are those two points fair summaries? Yes, they're, they're great points. And I love the differentiation you make between being customer centric and customer driven. It's, it's, they sound the same and we all talk about it, 
but we not, not we don't all do it. Mm-hmm. So it's a very important differentiation there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So what is a micro segment? Yeah. So think about it this way, right? Um, you can come and you can start segmentation at the highest level. For example, what's your customer's life cycle? Is he an active customer? Is she a new customer? Have they churned? Right? So usually you'll have your life cycle stages. And then you want to say, what comes under that? What is the next segmentation layer that you're going to put into? And that could be they like to purchase online. They like to purchase in store. They're an omni-channel customer. Or maybe they like to purchase at a certain uh, amount or below a certain amount. Do they return a lot of products? Do they not return a lot of products? Do they have a mobile app? Are they part of my loyalty? You get all of these different attributes that you can build. Now, when you start to layer many of these attributes on top of each other, you start to create these micro segments. You start to get very personalized. You get the people who like to purchase a specific category at a specific life cycle over a specific amount on online who actually respond to your SMS messages. Right? That's a very, very, very specific group that I can tell them something very, very personalized to them that's very relevant to them. Instead of just saying, this is a product that I want to send to everybody who's ever shopped at my store. Right? There's a difference here that you're going into. So what you're highlighting is that there's lots of data signals. A lot of which is the value of having first party data uh, all along the customer journey, all the digital footprints people leave along the journey. And you guys essentially act as a CDP also um, in, to be able to um, you know, analyze all the data from your advertising, your email campaigns and so forth. So you have first party data to uh, see all those digital footprints of how they engage with your media and your paid media and your own media uh, so that you can optimize the journey. And the micro segments are emerge from all the behaviors you're observing. Uh, Yogi Berra once said, you observe a lot by watching. All right, so you guys are observing a lot with the data all along the journey and allowing the micro segments to emerge from all those different rich first party data signals and Potentially, I, I would imagine companies can append third-party data to their data as well in your platform. Yeah, so um, 100%. And today, you know, the the theme of the hour is zero-party and first-party data, right? Third-party data still exists, uh, but it's becoming more and more difficult to use. Uh, a lot more regulation in that uh, in that space, right? And we want to allow uh, marketers to be able to access their first party data and their zero party data in a way that doesn't require them to go to a different team. That doesn't require them to wait in a line for somebody to give them a list. And then they're gonna say, oh, I actually, this attribute didn't actually work. Maybe we tweak it and now we have to wait another week until we can get this out, right? You wanna get the, the data as fast as you can. You wanna be able to play with that data as much as you can and as much as you want to then be able to connect it to those marketing activations that you're talking about, right? It's kind of like this closed loop that you want to run through over and over again in optimization. So in optimization, I often like to say there's if-then statements. If we did this, then this would be the outcome. What you're enabling is much higher velocity and data-driven approach to do these if-then statements with much greater control and empowerment of people to do it without having to queue up and get the data. Yeah, you know, it's if then or limited to your imagination, right? But you can't imagine tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of customers. You just can't. It's impossible. So you can't actually come with a serious face to management and say, yeah, we have a personalized journey, right? No, you don't. You can't imagine that. So you can't cater to that. You can't put if then statements in that world. You just have to let the data lead you and get insights based on AI, based on machine learning, analyze them, make decisions, and keep on iterating. This process never ends. You don't have uh, customers who get, sorry, or marketers, right, our clients, who get to 9,000 weekly or, or campaigns, messages, that is, just by doing if-then statements, right? It's an iterative process that takes time, that you get there, you build week over week. 
So a, a, a partner and friend of mine that I worked with a number of years ago coined a phrase I really like, um, from campaigns to capabilities, that we're shifting from kind of creating a campaign. There still are campaigns. It's not quite accurate because campaigns don't go away. But you're less reliant on briefing an agency, having them go do something. They, it's a black box. You don't, you don't get all the data. You don't own the data. And then they go do the work. There's great creative. It's lightning in a bottle in many cases. And then you, you, know, you end up trying to measure the results six, nine months later and waiting for the Nielsen data or other data to come back that's significantly lagging the actual in-market campaign. This is not a very effective test and learn model. And what you're, what you're doing is substantially increasing the velocity and the frequency of these sprints, uh, of these, you know, uh, the approach to drive this test and learn and allowing it to be emergent and driven by the AI with much more frequent interaction by people rather than they have to top down plan all of it. Yeah. So I, I call it what you would you just call it? I call it customer moments. Right. You want to create as many customer moments as possible and have an answer to that moment with a message that's ready to go as, as soon as that moment appears. Right. And imagine if you can do that and you can test it. So, for example, everything you do in our platform has a control group. So you're immediately testing against a baseline. You're immediately knowing if this moment that you've created, if this message for this instance is helping, not moving the needle or actually doing damage, right? We have a lot of customers that discover that they're, you know, this promotion is actually not needed and it's just eating away at their profits. And they could actually be more, grab more profit without even sending out that promotion. So you want to do this test and, and uh, this test and optimize, as you say, as you go. And what this is allowing you to do is as you grow your first zero and first party data, you're shifting more of your engagement from buying impressions to building experiences where you're able to then optimize next best content, next best asset, next best um, action in those moments. Right. So it's you're not buying impressions, you're kind of creating experiences in those moments. Yeah, we all know that um, acquiring customers and burning through them is not a good it's not a good strategy. Right. Um, to say the least, most brands out there do what I call reacquisition. They acquire a customer. They don't know that they've acquired that customer or they don't treat that customer any different than the customer that's never heard of them. And they just reacquire them over and over again. And the cost of that is humongous because each time that a customer purchases, even from the first time they even didn't purchase, they just visited your website. You have so much data on that person. You know what they looked at. You know what they like. You can do much more targeted things. Then they purchase. Now you have a lot more information, right? They came back again. You start, as you say, building that zero and first party data as you go. And you're, why would you leave it aside? Why would you say like, nah, that doesn't really matter to me. I'm just going to reacquire this person. I'm going to treat them like tabula rasa. Like I do not know who this person is at all and, and go from there. Right. And that, that's something that just doesn't make any sense. So a hot phrase now that a lot of people use is propensity. Who has a propensity to engage with my brand? Who has a propensity to buy my product? This drives customer lifetime value, right? Um, one of the things I find really kind of cool about Optimove is your origin story and the way you guys grew up is grounded in innovation in propensity theory and Markov theory, and that it's actually a different approach to using data and propensity theory to drive personalization. Did I get that right? Did you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So um, 100% right. So Pinny, who is a co the founder and the um, CEO of, of Optimove, he was a, a professor in industrial engineering. And he took this concept called the Markov chain and applied it to segmentation and to customer lifetime. And with that, he began to create a since the early beginnings, before there was a product, there was this agency that was doing segmentation and Excel tools and, and advanced models that was basically just saying, how can I predict what is going to be the propensity of a customer to churn, the propensity of a customer to convert, 
what is the lifetime value or the future value that this customer might have, right? And that allows you to add another layer into those micro segments that is an enriched layer from predictive analytics, if you will. At the end of the day, you come and you get this idea of this is who my customer is today. This is this context right now in real time. And this is where he can be in the future. All right. And when you get all of that together, that historical real time and future or predictive, then you suddenly start to understand where is my customer going and how can I help them get there? You become a much more better at experience. The whole notion of a journey implies there's a series of steps the customer has taken and is likely to take, and you can nurture and orchestrating a journey. I actually am not that thrilled with the phrase journey orchestration because it doesn't do justice to the emotional content in a customer journey. I mean, I guess orchestras have emotion, you're listening to music, but orchestrating sounds like engineering oriented, but I guess the point is it's data driven. But there's so much emotion in a customer journey. And what you're, what you're really doing is helping drive engagement with the right content and the right calls to action and the right experiences that you, you help nurture that journey. And it actually creates a very rewarding experience and an emotional connection with the customer. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Customers are, at the end of the day, people, right? We like to look at them as uh, alphanumeric ID on our database. <laughs> but, but they're people. They have feelings, they have good experiences, they have bad experiences. You have to be connected to that, right? One of the most fascinating and sometimes simplest use cases that I see people adopt is having customer data, customer service data within their CDP and marketing activities. Did this customer just give a positive review or a negative review? Did they just return a product? Did they just call my call center for information? All of these insights are telling you how your customer feels about you. Why not add them on top of the, let's call it dry data, that is, did they purchase? What are the platforms? What color do they like? When do they like to open their emails? At what time? All of these dry, rich it up with some emotion, with some um, feeling to become a person more than alphabetic, alphanumeric uh, line of code in a database. In an earlier uh, podcast, Ronnie, with Greg Stewart, the uh, CEO of MMA Global, where I'm uh, a CX subjects expert and I'm helping them um, expand their offerings and customer experience, um, Greg and I talked about a growth framework at MMA Global called the movable middle, which is linked to propensity theory, which is why I bring it up in our conversation. And the, the movable middle theory... And, and they put into practice with, um, I think, seven or eight experiments they've done to date with their members. Uh, that's one of the things the MMA Global does is they're actively partnered with members to do experiments to prove out these growth theories and then scale it across the membership, uh, which I find really cool because it's very actionable. And I'm excited to be part of that. Um, and what you do with Movable Middle is it turns out that you know, and, and Greg used the example of Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts. Someone who has a high propensity to engage with Dunkin' Donuts may have a low engage, propensity to engage with Starbucks or vice versa. Uh, the, just the two brands, you know, this would be true of Coke and Pepsi or a lot of other brands too. Um, and, you know, Huggies and Pampers. And, you know, if people have a high propensity to engage with one brand, they're not only more likely to pay attention to the ads or the content or other you know, stuff that is being pushed to them or and you're trying to engage from that brand, but they're actually less likely to pay attention to content from the other brand. And, you know, this, this actually goes back to this idea in advertising of the endemic environment. So if you put an ad in foodnetwork.com for a food brand, people are more likely to see it than if you put a food ad in the New York times, right? So that, that, that if the ad is highly relevant, I'm not dinging the New York times. There's a lot of relevant content that could work if you're on the food page in the New York times, but if you're consuming the news, you may actually not see many of the ads because they're not endemic. You just, you tune them out. 
the same principle actually applies with brands and they've proven it which is if you have someone that's in the middle, that 40 to 60%, they have some propensity to engage, but they're not a detractor or a loyalist, then they actually, there's a five to 10 X ROI for engaging them versus the detractor or the loyalist. So if you, you can target your spending, but what's really cool about this is you can also use it as a basis for thinking about optimizing your broader engagement across with data across everybody and tailoring the experience. What I, what I love about Optimove is it's actually doing this at scale where you're using data to um, personalize and target the experience based on real data into people's propensity uh, and then continuously optimizing the engagement with them. You know, if you think about this, a lot of people look at their database, look at their customers and say, these guys are very loyal to me. Let me really give them promotions or let me really be uh, in their, like, very, very in their face. But you could also say, these people are very loyal to me. I don't really have to market too hard to them. I don't want to take them for granted, but I can actually give them something that is tailored to them without losing, you know, without discounting or, or without going over the top and they will continue to come back. Then you have the, those who are not loyal, who, you know, come each holiday season. They just shop in holiday season, right? So one, I want to probably move them to lower cost channels of marketing if I'm marketing to them off season. And two, when I know if I'm using my data, I can know when they're going to come back, right? When that holiday season or when that moment that they buy, maybe it's their birthday that they buy is going to come back and I can, you know, ramp up my market. But then you have the big chunk at the middle, which is that movable middle. And to them, you really want to be very attentive to their needs. You want to be able to use data. You want to be able to use AI to make sure that they're getting the best message because most certainly, your movable middle is someone else's loyal customers and someone else's non-loyal customers. They're somewhere on that graph somewhere else, somewhere else. If you can provide them a better experience, if you can provide them a better message that speaks directly to what they need in that moment, you have a chance of making that shift. And that's what we want to do for you right? That's why we want to give you the access to the data. That's why we want to give you the AI that helps you optimize that based on your data. Because that's where you're going to make the most increment out of your investment. So a related point to here is like, how do you target them? How do you fill, figure out who they are? Um, you know, a lot of companies invest in things like net promoter score, which is a useful metric. I'm not a fan of golden metrics, you know, like single numbers because there's so much other data you use in a system of metrics that, I mean, what you're talking about is, 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 is constantly thinner and thinner slicing of the data with more and more data. Uh, it's the opposite of golden metrics, right? But net, net promoter is useful to companies who want to create some insight into who their promoters and detractors are and understand the driver analysis, but it doesn't allow an actionable approach to tailor the experience to them. It just gives you some high level insights of the drivers of your advocacy or, or detraction. Um, so how do you actually build an actionable profile of whether it's your movable middle or some other segmentation, micro segmentation approach? What kind of data is necessary to make this actionable? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, there's two ways of doing this. One is actually me not knowing. Let's say I have no idea how to build this. We have, uh, we introduced something in 2016 called OptiBot. And it's basically an AI bot that comes, looks at your campaign, looks at your marketing and tells you this message for this audience isn't really working, but there's a percentage within it that it's working gangbusters for. So why not free everyone else? Keep this percentage moving forward and try something else with the with the greater group. So you could basically just say, I don't know better. I'm just going to hit everything at once first. And then I'm going to come and I'm going to let this machine tell me, actually, this works for these people. Okay, let's take them out. Let's take this 
10% out. Let's do it again. Now let's take this 14% out. Now let's do this, right? And slowly but securely, you're going to optimize it. It's an iterative approach where the AI and machine exactly. learning learns how to play the game. Exactly. Yeah. So that's one option. Yeah. Option two is I have data, you know, I'm maybe a more established brand. Um, I have a bit more of history of my customer. They can start looking at it. And then you start and you come and you say, okay, again, let me start big. Let me take all my active customers, for example. Let me look at them. How do they distribute across different attributes? Maybe it's their preference of store. Maybe it's their average order amount, their items in the basket when they buy, their product preferences, right? Start looking at those pie charts that your customers have and start uh, slicing it, right? And again, and do it again and add some of that uh, predictive analytics that we talked about, right? And start finding those because you're going to find that the movable in the middle has a very high future value for you but they just don't behave like your top spender today. They don't be behave like that VIP tier. So let's compare between them. What's different between them? Let's look at both of them, one against the other, and let's see what is the difference. And let's push those behaviors in that movable middle that determine what is a VIP. I'd like to um, step back for a second and share something that I think will be interesting to the audience about the benefits of what we're talking about here above and beyond making your ROI of your campaigns and your marketing spend go up, okay? Beyond shifting, the, which is valuable, obviously, right? Um, a lot of companies invest money in research and testing and services to build their segments, to build their personas, to build out and design where they're focused. And then they do ongoing testing to improve their website, to improve their apps, to improve their product launches. In, in com some companies, this is between 20 and 100 million plus dollars a year for research and testing. You know, it's across a lot of categories. I've seen it in the 20 to 30 million range. I've seen it as high as 400 million plus on research and testing. So when you improve this dynamic test and learn approach with continuous insights, you can save 20 to 30% of your research and testing spend. So it's actually proven that when you start listening to the data signals and drive you know, with all your customer experience data, your customer listening signals, and there's a whole wealth of them now, and you start getting much more attention to the digital footprints in the campaign, and you create a faster velocity of test and learn, you actually are less reliant on third parties to do a lot of this testing and learning. You're not going to get rid of it, but you're just getting your people to do more of it using platforms like Optimove actually allows you to spend less on research and testing, which makes your investments more than self-funding. The amount of value that exists in always testing, in an always on testing mentality is humongous, right? It's savings, not only at the marketing level, but there's savings back in the value chain that will come from there. From you being able to say, this is even giving information to your, to your merchandising team, right? Like, or, or to your sales team, to so many different departments that will come from you just doing this iterative testing of what is working and what is communicating positively to your customers. The other benefit beyond the research and testing is the vendor rationalization. You know, that if you're using 10 or 15 vendors today, you might be able to do the same work with five or six vendors. So the, the fact that you can integrate so many different data sets and act as CRM, CDP, journey orchestration, you're bringing many different things together in a platform makes Optimove a candidate to be in a, in a stack that has fewer vendors in it than before. Um, you know, and or if you have a few today, you don't need to add as many vendors to grow your capability if Optimus in the stack. Um, so, um, you know, we talked a little bit about AI, but I want to come back to that a little bit more now, Ronnie. Um, so AI has been around a long time, but it's now getting a lot more attention. Um, how do you help companies leverage AI? You know, and where, you know, how do you apply AI and where do you see things heading? 
Yeah, so I think that the first part of this is that the leap that consume, consumable, let's call it consumable AI technology has done in the past 12 months is crazy, right? Today, um, you can really use AI for so many more use cases, especially in the marketing and the CX space that before would require a very sophisticated uh, team of data scientists and data engineers to put together. And today it's out there open source, free of for use and whatnot. The risk is looking at AI through that only lens, right? When you think about the workflow of a marketer, you have to think about where it starts, which is hopefully in discovering customer insights, right? All the way through creating the message, orchestrating the message, analyzing the results of that and back to discovering that customer insight so you want to create a, an ai or you want to offer an ai system that allows the marketer to get value from that technology at every single one of those uh, stops in the workflow or stages in the workflow and that's what we've done right that's how we approach it the AI and the customer insights comes a lot from the propensity models, a lot from understanding what is the best segment for a specific um, message or who in this segment is responding well to this message. The AI in the message itself and the creation comes, of course, of creation of copy, writing content for that. Then comes the AI in the decisioning, the next best action, the next best recommendation. What should I be showing my customer when they arrive to my website or to my app? Which message should I be sending them through which channel at what time? What offer should I be giving them within that message and that channel? And then that analysis of did this work? Now, if you're sending one campaign, no need for AI, right? If you're sending one message, no need for AI. If you're creating one experience, not needed. When you're doing this at scale, when you're talking about really doing personalized messaging, personalized marketing, personalized experiences for hundreds of thousands of customers, there's no way that a human can analyze that. And that's where it steps in. So I think that, you know, the more that we bring and we impermeate AI within the different workflows, the better. So how do you take this concept of generative AI and how do you make it so that it helps analyze the vast data sets that we had. And we talked about this before. How do you discover who is that movable middle? Well, wouldn't it be cool if I can come and just say, hey, you know, OptiBot in our case, or hey, AI, could you at the end of the day tell me who are customers who are have a high propensity to become a VIP and like to buy out of this category? And it could generate that segment for you, tell you how many customers they are, what are their characteristics, right? Okay, what should I tell them? What, what message should I give them? What experience should I create for them? Here are a few recommendations. Okay, can you create that for me? Imagine how much better the marketer becomes when they're actually not um, weighed down by the need to perform these complex analyses by themselves, when they can just talk about them, like we just had this conversation. You know, what you're doing is taking the principles of lean startup and applying AI to them on an ongoing basis. A lean startup, you know, what, what I love this framework of who's the right customer and what's the right value proposition. And a lean startup has to get these two questions right before they run out of money or, you know, willingness to spend more time. Right. Um, and, um, you know, you can get one or both of those right or wrong. And a, a, a typical startup may pivot five to 10 times before they get both of those right uh, or fail, right? What you're actually enabling uh, with the AI in Optimove is you're lowering the cost and complexity of constant experimentation on these two questions. Do I have the right customer? Do I have the right value proposition with data? And, and applied to you know marketing, sales, and service. So you can constantly experiment at much lower cost, much faster 
based on data and let the answers emerge informed by the AI and have human beings involved to help guide this and iterate. It's very cool. Very cool. Um, what are um, what are the key metrics that you use to measure success with customers? Yeah, so our gold metric at the end of the day is customer lifetime value. That's the golden metric, right? How do we help you increase the lifetime value of your customers? How do we make sure that your customers continue to come back, they build loyalty with you, right? And that it becomes a profitable business through those customers. But each company that works with us has their own goals, their own KPIs that they want to measure. We don't want to just measure revenue. We want to measure sales in store and sales online. We don't want to measure just profits, but we want to measure average discount in orders or average items per order. And we have to allow that flexibility. We want to allow you that in one campaign, you can see all of these KPIs. What is the incremental impact of this message, of this campaign, of this journey, of this experience, whatever it is, on any of your business KPIs. And then what does that mean for your lifetime value? So that's how you build trust with our client base, right? By telling them, look, this is the impact that you're having. This is actual impact in orders, items, revenue, whatever it is, that your activities that you're planning using Optimove are having against the baseline everything against the baseline. That's fantastic. Um, Ronnie, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a ton of fun. I always enjoy chatting with you uh, and, and, and the work we do with clients. And um, uh, just to close out, are there any things you would encourage your our listeners to check out or engage with to learn more about Optimove or to get started on some of the things we talked about today? Yeah, 100%. So one, uh, our website is full of resources that are built to help companies go into this customer-led marketing approach. So go into Optimove, go into our blog or into a learning center, and you will find their information that will help you walk through the journey that is going from being product-led or campaign-led to being customer-led in your marketing. And the second thing is for those who really want to dive into this, we have our conference every year in October. It's connect.optimove.com. You can visit it. Um, we have a great agenda this year with a keynote from Google's chief strategist, Neil Hoyne, who will be talking about data-driven decisions for leadership in marketing. And you can come join us and learn from the brands that are actually doing customer-led marketing in two days, full of great chats, great opportunities to meet and mingle and learn from these brands. And Matt, I just want to say it's been a pleasure being here. I appreciate uh, you having and hosting me. It's uh, always, as you said, entertaining. And I always learn a lot from just chatting with you and getting the opportunity to be together for a while. Thanks, Ronnie. And just one thing to uh, pile on with the um, Connect event is that I will plan on being there. I know I'm excited to be there. So I would encourage the audience to attend. It'll be great to see you there. Thanks again for uh, for joining our listeners out there. And I uh, hope this podcast sparks some great ideas for you and look forward to the conversations. Thanks, Ronnie. Look, look forward to talking again soon.